Swimming, American swimming, a story of performance, success, involvement. In the last five Olympics, against the best in the world, American swimmers have won 139 gold medals. Taking part in those international triumphs has meant as much to me, probably, as anything I've ever done in my life. I'm Don Scholander. In 1964, I became the first swimmer ever to win four gold medals in a single Olympics. Each medal represented several thousand hours of my life. That's a long time and a lot of work. Multiply that by some 100,000 volunteers around this country, and you have a lot of people spending long hours trying to keep America's swimming performance at its highest level in the world competition. This is their story. <laughs> I enjoy swimming so much that it's just, just part of me right now. Shirley Babishoff has held 12 world and 43 American records. So determined was Shirley to be the best that she commuted more than 120 miles a day to attend morning and evening practice at the Mission Viejo Natadores Swim Club. Her workout did not end until she endured a half hour of weight training and up to 12 miles of swimming. That's every day. For Shirley, that drive for success revealed itself at an early age. When she was about 11, and she was doing sit-ups early in the morning, and I was supposed to be holding her feet. She had, a, I believe, a 10-pound weight in the back of her head. And I felt so sorry for her waking up in the morning and doing these sit-ups. And I think she had to do about 100 of them at that time. And at 50, I said, why don't you just quit? And she just told me, no, Dad, I can't. I can't quit. If I do, I'm through. And she kept going, and she finished. And this is how her dedication works. She just doesn't quit. She goes all the way. From Moscow to Montreal, Shirley Babishoff has won 98% of all the races she has entered. Many believe she is the best American female swimmer ever. For Shirley Babishoff and young athletes like her, swimming is a personal commitment. Unless you have done it, you can't imagine what it's like to swim up and down a pool four or five hours a day, and then do it again tomorrow, and the next day, and the next. The most demanding training any athlete will endure. So what is the spark that ignites the burning desire necessary to become a competitive swimmer? For many, the first exposure to techniques is at one of the numerous AAU-supported clinics. Here, experienced coaches provide the basics and these youngsters receive their initial contact with the sport. Let's pick up the tempo, set the There are some 3,000 AAU-affiliated swim clubs in the United States. The instruction here is more sophisticated, geared for the competitive swimmer. Still a little bit up, up in front. Now you're still getting those elbows back in here just a little bit. When your hands get here, Turn them under just a little bit. Just try and force the elbows forward. But you don't want to hold them out there to stop the water. But don't release them so soon. This is the John E. DuPont pool near Philadelphia. And from here, Coach Frank Keith drills and directs a group of swimmers whose desire is to be the best. Freestyle. Ready? Hop! The intense competition between these swimmers in dual meets builds to a peak of individual performance at the AAU Long Course Championships. Here, reputations are at stake, rivalries reach their zenith, and records are constantly in jeopardy. At this moment, swimming is a lonely sport. Your sprints, your endurance, your tapering is over. You alone are in the spotlight. Every muscle strains. Your mind urges you on. Your body responds. Pain is ignored. 
your strokes are smooth, your splits are fast. You are swimming for a championship. After all the endless toil that preceded it, victory is significant. Defeat is crushing. These are the AAU Nationals. The exciting part is going to a national AAU where you're with the big time, you're with the, the kids that have come up from nothing to something, and you have everybody there gunning at you. And to win the finals, you got to break the record. So I swam the race, and uh, it was a smart race. It wasn't smart enough to break the record, but coming three one hundredths of a second from a world record is held by Mark Spitz. I guess after you win and feel that success of winning, you sort of aren't tired, you're all happy and stuff like that. Well, I got to be where I got out of the water and said, I wish I could jump up and do that race again because I think I could do it. The desire to be the fastest ever is a continuing struggle. The lifespan of a world record is often from a morning qualification to an evening final. But are there any limits? How fast can a person swim? There's not really a limit to how fast kids can get until you reach zero, really. The facilities will get better and kids will work harder and it's inevitable that the records will just keep breaking. You're watching Tim Shaw set a world record in the 400 meter freestyle. His time was nearly 20 seconds faster than the world mark I set in the same event at the 1964 Olympics. That's a lot of improvement. And even more incredible is the fact that along with the 400 meter mark, Tim Shaw has held the world mark for the 200, 800, and 1500 meter freestyle. Swimmers are improving so dramatically that within a three month period surrounding the Montreal games, world records were set in 24 of the 25 Olympic swimming events. The only mark untouched was Mark Spitz's 100-meter butterfly. All those new standards were achieved only after years of exhaustive training. Proper coaching and stroke technique are part of that training. Olympic coach George Haynes, who was my coach for seven years, has spent most of his life in competitive swimming. George is an expert on the mechanics of the four competitive strokes. Let's listen to what he has to say. The pull and butterfly is uh, much like uh, the hourglass, where in the entry of the hands, it's about shoulder width, with the thumbs down, the hands are facing out, the palms are pulling from the outside in, underneath the body, uh, fairly close together, and pushing through, much like a freestyler. The breathing comes in as uh, late in the stroke, much like breaststroke. Your hands are about in this position, the chin up, and get the forehead down so that's easy recovery of the arms. Butterfly swimming, a rhythm stroke, the most demanding of the four competitive strokes. Backstroke swimming, probably is one of the most pretty strokes in, of the four uh, competitive strokes. And most of our top backstrokers uh, use uh, what we call a vertical recovery, where their arms are uh, fairly straight on the recovery over the surface of the water. Where their hand is going into the water with a little finger first, pulling with a straight arm until about the width of the shoulder, bending their elbow and pushing the palm of the hand through the water and down through the leg. The leg kick is uh, much like freestyle. Your legs are used as a balancing uh, factor in the stroke. If you have a, a swimmer who is tall and fairly long armed and real strong shouldered individual and quite flexible, generally they make good backstroke swimmers. At six foot six, Olympic champion John Neighbor is the perfect prototype of the rangy yet powerful backstroke swimmer. In breaststroke swimming, there are three or four fundamental phases of the stroke that we should try to remember. And the number one thing is that at the complete stretch and at the completion of each leg kick, the body should be in a flat, horizontal position with the forehead slightly down. And the second thing is that 
uh, each breaststroker remembers to breathe as late in the stroke as possible. And what I mean by that is that the hand should be well into the stroke, the head coming up, and the chin on the surface of the water in about this position when the breaststroker takes a breath. If you have a nice late breath, the kick uh, has a natural tendency to come up into a high position and uh, the feet are used as much like a hand when they go through the water. Olympic champion John Hinken shows the high kick, the late breath, and a smooth, flawless style. The breaststroke, a complicated yet precise stroke. Freestyle swimming is the fastest of the four competitive strokes. And I think the most important thing in, in freestyle swimming is the rhythm and coordination of the arm movement with the breathing. If you breathe on the left, as your hand goes in the water, you should turn your head and breathe through the mouth at about a 45 degree angle. And as the recovering arm or the breathing side arm comes over, that head should move back to the midline or to the middle of the body uh, and not look at the arm as it comes over. In sprinting, you cut down on the breathing and distance swimming, you're breathing every stroke. And it's important to breathe every stroke in distance uh, freestyle. Her stroke may not be classic freestyle, but Shirley Babishoff attacks the water with a ferocity that spells success. No female swimmer ever has won more medals in Olympic competition than Shirley Babishoff. Believe me, coaches like George Haynes are vital to accomplished swimmers with Olympic aspirations. In fact, George Haynes was much more than just a coach for me. He was almost like a second father. He was that important. In the headlines, you see only the swimmer. But behind every competitor, there's been a coach and an organization to make it all happen. This is the AAU house, Indianapolis, Indiana. The nerve center for more than 100,000 volunteers. Officiating and organizing, donating time and talent on a local and national level. Here's the backbone of the Amateur Athletic Union in action. Housewives, bank presidents, truck drivers, parents, concerned people who want to get involved. Each of these tireless workers takes pride in the fact that every American swimmer who participated in the Olympic Games was a product of an AAU program. In addition to pre-Olympic competition, the AAU provides world-class swimmers the opportunity to compete around the world in Europe, the Far East, Australia, South America. New Zealand was probably the place that I'd never get without a EAU funding it. Uh, moved to New Zealand for a little over a week and a half. I don't think that swimming would be as much fun if the trips weren't there. Because like if I'm working out and I'm, I'm really tired or I'm just not with it that day, I'll think about a trip that's coming up and it'll make me feel a lot better. Not too long ago, we told Shirley, we said, well, you know, just think the Olympics, one more year, and the Olympics will be over. And if you make that, you know, you can go ahead and relax and quit swimming. And she told us, she said, I think I'll keep swimming as long as I can make the trips. 